We have, for, for some time now, been caught in a feedback loop that tells us the only way to encourage positive behavior in humans is by force. We think people won't save enough money, so we take their money and pay it back to them, pennies on the dollar. Uh, we keep our children in a quagmire of warped incentives getting worse and worse results every year. Some of us are trying our best to kill off an environmentally friendly industry that's made the United States a net energy exporter for the first time in recent memory. Since we believe this behavior is for the greater good, we can justify it, embrace it, and double down on it, even when it's very clear that it's not working, or in many cases, backfiring. It doesn't have to be this way. In the 1990s, I worked for a company that encouraged participation in a United Way drive. Now the United Way has had its ups and downs over the years, but the idea was the owners of this company wanted their employees to support the United Way. These folks, the, the owners of the company, were among the best people I've ever run into in my life. They ran a very successful growing company that did great work and treated its employees well, while at the same time being super nice and courteous individuals. That's not an easy balance to strike, as many of my former employees would no doubt be the first to point out. Um, now, charity was important to the people who owned this company, and they made it very clear, very clear, that they wanted their employees to share their values. It was never written down or said, but it was generally understood that if you wanted to get ahead in this company, you would be supporting the United Way. There were so many options, how to give, and who to give to that any reasonable person could find an option to suit them. And there wasn't really an expectation as to how much someone would give, although the expectations for owners were considerable, any kind of participation by employees was good enough. This program contributed substantially to the greater good and was done entirely without force. No, withholding a promotion is not force. The threat of incarceration for declining to support the greater good, that that's force. Socialists, I, I'll give you so, one thing. That every time that I think it's impossible for you to come up with something more illogical than the last harebrained scheme, you somehow manage to surprise me. Socialists are against charity because they think it's too controlling. You see, something is only truly charitable if it's extracted by force and given without regard to merit. How do they come up with these things? The idea of supporting the greater good without resorting to force is examined in a wonderful book by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein called Nudge. Using a concept they call libertarian paternalism, these authors argue in favor of influencing people's choices without force by encouraging certain choices without banning others. Unfortunately, they also endorse the use of incentives code for forcible confiscation of property as necessary, but they're onto something with their emphasis on using nudges in some cases. What do they mean by a nudge? Okay, putting fruit instead of junk food at eye level in a highly trafficked area of the grocery store is a nudge. Auto-enrolling employees in a retirement plan they can opt out of is a nudge. Now, banning junk food and using tax money for retirement plans is not. Now, it doesn't sound like a very powerful tool, but consider the following. If you ask people on the day before an election whether they're going to vote, the chances of them voting increases by 25%. Asking a group of students a date and planned route to get to their vaccinations instead of just asking if they're getting one increased participation from 3% to 28%. Auto-enrolling employees in retirement programs nearly doubles participation, potentially having a huge effect on long-term wealth for many people. The authors propose creative ways to decrease the use of force and increase the use of, let's call it, suggestion across many sectors of society. Finance, obviously, health, education, environment, even interpersonal relationships and institutions like marriage. Now, I'm sure too much nudging would eventually get annoying, hence the title of the segment. 
but like anything else, it would have to be perfected through real-world experience. But importantly, nobody would end up in jail for opting out of a nudge. Now, this is a book that the authors actually wanted to publish, so they left out a very important piece of information on making nudges work. After having been nudged, and after having consciously opted out, meaning consciously turning away from a better decision path, the full consequences of that decision must fall on the individual making it. Selfish, greedy, hateful, no. Supportive, helpful, and, and, nonviolent. These ideas are here now, easy to implement, cheap, not intrusive, and we're still not using them. Why? Because those bad humans over there aren't doing the right thing, and they, they need to be controlled. It's all up here, folks. All of it. All up here. She gave us these brains for a reason. If we continue to break her rules, her rules are going to break us. It's times like this I like to read Steven Pinker, focus on the data, and skip over the glaring contradictions that keep him on the lecture circuit. Then I like to read Nassim Taleb, focus on the logic, and skip over the parts where he tells me how stupid I am. After having done that, well, I actually don't, don't feel any better, but I do start to believe that we may actually make it. Not